Our next speaker is John. He'll talk for five minutes for one minute in questions. Am I live? Can you hear me? Okay, good. Okay, so uh, I look forward to having uh, more updated, whoops, what's happening here? There we go. I look forward to having more updated uh, Atlas uh, videos, but the point I wanna make with this, everybody's seen it and we all went, wow, that's pretty cool. But I wanna make the point that the robotics objective is different than what we're doing when we're looking at what people are doing. You know the actuators, you know the design in the feedback, and so the idea is the control regime that is effective is important. What we've got is a robot that works really, really well, but we don't know much about the actuators, we don't know much about the feedback control, and we certainly don't know much about the control regime. And in spite of that, these machines are doing remarkable things. So our objective is actually reverse engineering. What can we do to figure out how these things work as well as they do? So one of the ways we approach this is to take uh, predictive models, look at, try and, try and predict how people should move in particular circumstances and then dissect the model. We tend to focus on uh, events that are discrete. So this is the parkour wall run where we, the uh, objective is to use your legs to scale a wall that you're not capable of scaling uh, by simply jumping up there. So there's a particular technique that's used to do that. Uh, we developed a multi-phase optimization model compared to the human, but the objective is not to match the model to the human. What the objective is, is to probe the model, mostly because our subjects don't like us probing them personally. So the idea here is that we've got a point mass model. The, the, we're looking at how the legs manage the trajectory of the center of mass. That's the task that we're looking at. Two massless legs, a point foot, so there is no ankle, a uh, telescoping leg with, that's extensible to a limit that we think is comparable to the human leg, so it doesn't have a flexing knee. In all other regards, it's identical to the human knee. Now, that's supposed to be a joke because this is nothing like the human knee, but that, the human leg, but in any case, uh, positive leg forces, max forces bounded. In this case, we just put, took the maximum empirical ground reaction force that we measured. Small penalty for force rate, so it just doesn't default to impulsive activity. And the endpoint is determined uh, as the, what happened to the pointer here? Anyway, the highest point that, that the individual achieved uh, was, was where they, is there? Okay, uh, oh, I got it, I've got it, Andy. Okay, so what we've got here are two force plates, one in the horizontal surface, one in the vertical surface. The vertical surface one, the, the wall behind it is the same as this wall, steel girders with uh, reinforced cement block, so it's solidly in there. And then we can follow the individual either kinematically or what we prefer is using the ground reaction forces. This is a typical, these guys are, are crazy that do the uh, parkour. They have this, uh, uh, um, attitude of if you go up you go on and that's it's a it's a uh, really interesting group to work with uh, so showing that we can follow this stuff and then the idea is to compare what the model does to what the you, the person does here we've got the trajectory the empirical uh, with the dotted line the model with the dash line we've got the ground reactions force the massless leg, so that explains why you have none of these impact spikes that we see in the ground reaction forces. And then there is a slight difference between the height at initial contact uh, for this part because we measured leg length with the individual standing and then realized that they have a leg and they can tilt their pelvis and all sorts of things. But we elected not to uh, account for that because again, our objective is not to match these trajectories exactly but have a model that's doing dynamically what these people are doing so that then we can take the model apart. So this is constrained, a con constrained initial velocity and the contact points. If we take away those constraints, then the model accepts that it is, has uh, its leg length challenged and just deals with it, but it does it in the same way that the individual does. But what is really cool about this is the unconstrained 
initial velocity and the empirical initial velocity are basically identical. And that's a really key feature to this. Uh, I think you've got two legs, you can make that transition in a certain way by making contacts at certain places, but the initial velocity tells us a lot about what's going on in this system. So what we have here is the positive work bounded, negative work bounded, red for the ground, blue for the um, uh, wall leg. We've colored in the space, that's not an area, but the precise measurements are those bounds, but just to show how this system works. Low speed, positive work dominates. High speed, substantial negative work and positive work to manage the uh, uh, trajectory. Intermediate speed, positive and negative work balance. And that's one definition of a spring. So this system defaults to a spring-like action. The model doesn't have a spring. So the optimum solution is spring-like leg behavior in spite of the fact that the leg doesn't have a spring. And that's for the uh, surface and the wall and so we can look at how these change the optima changes but the in for each of the speeds but here's your spring-like model no springs and here's my acknowledgement that i've always wanted to publish in a paper thank you okay we have time for one or two questions thanks I'm wondering about the necessity of the handholds at the top. Can like can can people do this without needing the something to grab onto in order to redirect their velocity? So an interesting question. So we we did the transition before they got a chance to do any of the scrambling stuff that they do. So if they go above these two contacts, they'll use their other feet their next foot on the wall, they'll scramble with their hands, all sorts of interesting things. In the environment, they don't care. They grab uh, bars on windows and all sorts of things. That's gonna change the, the issues, I think. We were looking at how are they gonna manage that transition from going horizontal to vertical, so that we set up. We, did, we had a three meter wall. Um, these guys could go much, much higher than that, I'm absolutely certain, but then there's gonna be other uh, uh, strategies involved, and we were looking at focusing on that initial horizontal to vertical transition. Um, I'm wondering, did no, you thanks. model friction, and did it have any effect, the friction on the wall? So, uh, undoubtedly, the friction does. I mean, if we'd have put Teflon and oil on there or something like that, they couldn't have done what they did. I think they had, as long as they've got reasonable friction, they will use it. There's not a lot that they can do on the wall because the more they push up, the more they have to push out, and that changes their contact with the wall, especially if they've got a limited leg length. Okay, let's thank, thank John. You.